Hi folks, welcome back. Thank you for watching. Please do hit subscribe if you haven't done so yet. It really does help when you do that. So today, folks, welcome to the end of month Q&A video for March 2022. And I'm leaving it a little bit late in the day to shoot this. It's now gone 7 p.m. on the evening of the 30th. So if you're watching this at midnight on the 31st UK time, I didn't screw up. So this is really going to test my abilities to shoot a video in one take and my video editing skills, my internet upload speed. So fingers crossed you will get this video in time. So let's see who is first up this month. Yusuf Kasim, what would be the only pedal you would keep if you had to only keep one? And which amp would you keep if you only had to pick one? Um, it wouldn't be a gain pedal because I can get all the gain sound I need just by cranking amps. And I've got amps with reverb tanks in, so it wouldn't be a reverb. It would probably be a modulation of some description or a delay. Let's go with a modulation, because I love cheesy 80s modulations. Uh, probably the Boss Dimension C. There's just something about that pedal I really love. And it works for everything from big 80s classic rock sounds through to clean, sparkly stuff and everything in the middle. So let's go with that for the pedal. And for the amp, I'm going to skip ahead to the next question, because I think from memory, yep, this is a question all about my amps too, from Joe Staup. Out of all your amps, which is your favourite three you own? Uh, my JTM45 clone, which is probably my favourite, to go back to the last question, that's the one I would keep out of all of them. Uh, the Orange Retro 50, because it's just Jimmy Page classic rock central, I love it. And the Dr. Z Z-Rec, for the clean, chimey AC30 thing, and it also sounds incredible when it's cranked. So I'm a British amp guy at heart, so that kind of covers all the basic food groups there. So those are my three favourite amps that I own. Andrew Eason Bentley, how do you find that these compare to the Fane A60? I have one of those in my Romany Pro and I remember you used it as well a while back. And this is the comparison video between the Jensen P12R and the Celestian Blue. I would say, in, I haven't put these side by side, but this is just going by instinct. I would say the Fane is probably a fair bit flatter in the mid range than those two speakers because both the Jensen and the Celestian are very sort of pushed in the mids. In different frequency bands, the Jensen's a bit more kind of fizzy in the upper mid range, the Celestian's a bit more barky in the lower mid range, but they're definitely mid rangey speakers, that's what they're designed to do. Whereas the Fane has a good amount of low end to it, a lovely clarity when you want it, but the mid range is a little bit more kind of flat throughout the whole range. So th that's what I would say the difference would be. The Fane's not going to be quite as kind of pushed in the mids as those other two. Marco Vitiello. In my opinion, Celestian is too mid-heavy and I prefer Jensen speaker in this amp. Maybe only with Astrotone fuzz, I prefer the Celestian. And also, Andrew Nicholson, I have a Victoria 5112. Upgrading the Jensen to a Celestian blue completely changed the amp for the better. It went from being boxy and flat to having tons of character. I'm definitely in the blue plus tweed group. So two contrasting opinions there. And this is what I love in these comparison videos, that there is no correct answer. Everybody has a different take. Everybody prefers different things. So it's always nice to have that healthy discussion in the comments. And most of the time, everyone's very respectful to each other, which is great to see. Joe Toe, preference for Kingsley tube gain. Um, I've got two Kingsley pedals here, the Page and the Jester. Um, if I had to choose just one, I'd probably choose the Jester because you have the two sides to it, so three different sounds in one. Uh, but the Page is amazing too. I could quite happily use the Page as my only overdrive that I ever need. So either of those, those are the two I have experience with. I'm sure the others are absolutely phenomenal as well. Everything Simon touches seems to turn to gold. So those are my two preferences because that's what I've got here. They are both astonishingly good. Bry Guy? Bry G? Sorry, Bry. Time stands still. Perfect life's and tone to try out on that super thin, clean sound. And this was the Rockman Guitar Ace. Yes, absolutely. Those kind of Alex Lifeson type 80s sounds are what the Rockman was designed for, really. Unfortunately, as much as I love Time Stands Still and I can play it, the YouTube copyright police aren't overly fond of people playing copyrighted riffs. So I couldn't play that exact one. But yes, that is the exact ballpark that pedal lands you in. 
Douglas Green, Joe, got yourself a winner there. Very clear sounding and I like the headstock. It's a shame Mr. Shepard doesn't still make guitars. And this is probably one of the bigger videos I had this month, which is my acquisition of the Nathan Shepard NSG1. And I really like the headstock too. It definitely divides opinion. A lot of people online hate this thing. I think it's really cool. And there's a few more questions about this guitar here. Reckless Toboggan, I'm astounded. Good. You find far cooler left-handed stuff than I can find as mostly lefty though, for some weird reason, plays righty. A lot of people do. I think Mark Knopfler's lefty and plays righty. Or am I thinking of Clapton? Someone like that. One of those sort of massive guitarists is left-handed and plays righty. Between this and your JTM45 claim, told you it was good, and your 1970s lefty Strat, and all of the left-handed pedals and amps and guitar strings and pickups that you managed to find, haha, you need to do a video on your Sherlock level gear finding skills. Um, you say skills, I say unhealthy obsession. It's just keeping an eye on the usual outlets. eBay, Reverb, your local guitar shops in your country that ship. Um, it doesn't have to be local to you as such, but in, in your country with cheap shipping that they will send things. Uh, just check the secondhand sections. That's what I do. I've got them all on tabs at the top of my browser so I can just quickly flick through, see if anything new has been listed and if there's a really good deal there and I can afford it and it's something I want, I can jump on it. But this guitar was just a reverb find. It was listed for quite a while and eventually I haggled the, uh, the owner down to a much more reasonable price and snagged it. But yeah, there's no skill to it. It's just keeping up to secondhand sections, eBay and Reverb, really. Enrico Palazzo. It wouldn't be a Q&A without Enrico. That's a really cool guitar, Joe. I really love how Coco Bolo, which is the wood that this has on the top and the headstock and the fretboard. I really love how it looks and I would love to own a custom guitar with that particular wood. As a tone wood, do you think it's similar to maple or mahogany? I'm not a super telly fan, but this particular guitar has a telly on steroid kind of vibe that I really like and the mods you've done are quite interesting. I've actually done more mods to it since I shot that video. I'm probably gonna make another video with this, maybe this month, showing you the further mods I've done and why I've done them. But you can see one of them, the fact it has three silver saddles and three gold saddles, but I'll tell you more about that in that video. Um, in terms of the Coca Bola wood, it's really hard to gauge what this guitar sounds like and whether it's down to the wood or the construction, because it's so different. It's a through neck design, which is unlike any other guitar I own. It's chambered a bit like a Gretsch Duo Jet, I suppose, or a 335 even. So it's really hard to gauge why this sounds the way it does and whether it's down to the pickups or the constructions or the wood or whatever. But I, I, from what I've read, I think Coco Bolo is similar to like Rosewood, at least on the fingerboard. So I, I don't honestly know Enrico is the truth on that. But um, I love the guitar. I love how it sounds. And I think the whole thing's a system. Everything works together. And as you'll see in that video about the further mods I've made, you change one thing and it kind of skews something else. So it's all a very fine balancing act to really dial a guitar in to suit you. But more on that soon, probably. Finn Golding, I absolutely love your new guitar, but I have a question for you. In a moment of 80s nostalgia madness, which is where I live, I bought a Jackson Soloist because I wanted a pointy head neck through guitar in my collection and it looks fantastic. But like you, I can't get on with the bridge pickup sound. It's a bare knuckle nail bomb, which is 15.7 DC and muddy as hell and no amount of EQ can brighten it up. I prefer much more treble. So do you think swapping it for a standard Gibson style humbucker at around 8 DC might be a solution. Uh, yeah, definitely. As you will have seen in the initial video of this guitar, it had, so I've given another way, uh, given away another of the changes I've made to this guitar, it had push-pull pots in, which it doesn't anymore. And um, I was basically using a coil tap mod that Lindy Fral in the States kind of developed and basically doing a partial split of the second coil. So rather than having um, just the single telly bridge coil and then the full thing in humbucking mode, I'm basically only using about 30% of the second coil. The rest of it's been dumped to ground. So it brings the DC right down, brings a lot more clarity and treble back into it. But to be honest, I'm only doing that because I really don't want to change these pickups. A, because they're really synonymous with Nathan's guitars, but also because to get it that size and shape, on the bridge pickup, it would have to be custom made and it would cost a fortune, which I really don't want to do if I can avoid it. So I'm kind of modding it to fix a problem. 
if it was as easy as just buying a PAF and dropping it in this guitar, I probably would do that, is the honest truth. So if you have a guitar that's routed to accommodate a standard size humbucker, and I mean, the bare knuckle nail bomb is a really, really hot pickup. They, they can sound great in the right situations, but it's not the sort of pickup I would go for. If you like the sort of Les Paul PAF sound, yeah, I would probably put a different pickup in there because you don't want to be fixing problems. It's better to get it right in the first place, I always think. Chris Hash, that's the last one for this guitar, so I'm gonna put it down. Chris Hash, how does this match up to the small trees? This is the Effectrode Fire Bottle. After scoring fake plastic trees and seeing your demo, I have a small trees en route. Can't decide on the Mercury Furs, probably used mostly for mid game, which is how I run mine, or a Kingsley, though I find them a bit too traditional slash classic rock for my taste a lot of the time. That's exactly why I love them, I live classic rock. I need more clarity, fidelity slash flatter EQ. Um, between the Mercury and the Kingsley, they're both of equal quality, slightly differently voiced. Uh, I think you'll probably get more tone shaping on the Kingsley, uh, but the Mercury Fuzz is incredible. As, as I said, I use it for low gain stuff too. Um, in terms of the fire bottle versus the small trees, um, I haven't put them side by side and compared them, but what I want to say is I think the Fire Bottle has a fair bit more gain in terms of decibels. I think it was like 30 dB of boost or something. I think the Small Trees is about 18 or 20, so it's about two thirds of the gain. So it won't get quite, it won't push the signal quite as hard into your amp. And I would say that the Fire Bottle is a little bit more shaped in terms of its EQ. It's designed to be a kind of fendery type boost, whereas the Small Trees is just a completely flat, pretty much, just pure level boost. It doesn't really tame the EQ at all or change anything. So I think those are the two differences, less gain and less tone shaping in the small trees, but both are absolutely amazing pedals. I use them both all the time and they're just amazing. Rockstar Accountant, brilliant name. Thanks for proving that this really isn't too big a deal. And this is the YouTube compression video from a couple of months ago. A bigger issue today with commercial music is the brick wall mastering techniques that squeeze all of the dynamic range out of music and try and make it sound loud. That would be another interesting video that is somewhat in this vein. And if you want music with better dynamic range, stick with vinyl since the format limits are loudness. So you can probably see the turntable on the table over my shoulder there. I love vinyl. Um, thank you for this comment. And you know, without going on a rant about modern mastering, whenever I record like my own songs, I generally master them myself. I have worked with professional mastering engineers in the past. Nowadays, I generally master my own stuff now that my skills are slightly better than they once were. And even when I was working with professional mastering engineers, like my first album was mastered by Ray Staff at Air Studios, like a legendary British mastering engineer. And I was lucky enough to go and get to sit with him while he mastered the album. And I basically said to him, like, you mastered Zeppelin albums in the 70s. I want this album mastered like that. I don't care about volume. I want dynamics and I want it to sound as good as it can, not super loud, which I think he appreciated. And now that I master my own stuff, I'm always careful to not push it too hard, keep the dynamic range. It's what makes music interesting and keeps it nice to listen to. As soon as something's brick wall, it's distorted as hell. And yes, that death magnetic sounds good on little earbuds, but it sounds like junk on every other speaker I've listened to it on. So, you know, brick wall mastering has its place, but generally speaking, I prefer things that are mastered in a kind of old school tradition, dynamic range. That's what music's all about. So yes, thank you for this comment, rant over. Carper craft guitars, carpentry, jewelry, and art. Love your effort here and appreciate it immensely. Thank you. I've been in soldering 101 as I'm building my own guitars now and it is a learning curve for sure. Can anyone tell me why you wouldn't use 100k pots? Is it just the resistance? For memory, I believe the very earliest strats, like the 1954 strats in the, like the first iteration with the Alnico 3 pickups and things, I think they did have 100k pots in. Excuse me. But the problem with 100k pots is the lower the resistance of the pot, the more high end it will shelve off. The higher the resistance of the pot, the more high end it will let through, which is why humbuckers, which are typically darker pickups, have 500k pots to let more high end through. With single coil pickups, 500k can quite often sound a bit shrill. So 250k just shelves off a little bit more high end and makes something sound like a Strat or a Tele. 100k pots would shelve off, shelve off even more top end. And I would say guitars with 100k pot just sound 
unusably dark for me because I like top end and clarity. Might work in certain situations, but generally speaking, that will be a very dark sounding guitar. So that's pretty much the reason why nobody uses 100k pots routinely. Um, but at the end of the day, if it works for you and you want to tame a crazy bright pickup and 100k pots give you the sound you're going after, go for it. You know, whatever works for you to achieve the sound you're going after. That's the general rule of modern guitars is if it works and sounds good to you, leave it alone. The artist in his studio. Thank you for this video. I found it very helpful and I ended up getting a set of Hot Dwayne's for one of my Les Pauls and I couldn't be happier. I really need to play my Les Paul Custom on this channel more because that guitar with the OX4 Hot Dwayne pickups is I, I, I nicknamed that guitar the Juggernaut because it just smacks you in the face. And for me, the Hot Dwayne's were what really made me realise that a pickup is a system. And before those, I would have said, I don't like uncovered PAF pickups. They're too shrill. But those pickups are designed to be uncovered and everything's kind of wound and voiced and the magnets are selected to be uncovered. And they are just godly. So... You know, there are no hard and fast rules, and the Hot Dwayne's just prove that I can like open pickups if they are voiced to be open. So, yes, amazing pickups, cannot recommend them highly enough. Tiago Borsari, I think. I went from a PCB modern style Les Paul Classic from 2019 to a 50s style wiring. OMFG. I turned the guitar that I already loved into the best guitar I have ever played. We'll do the same on every Gibson I own. And yeah, my, my Les Paul Junior, when I bought that, had one of the Gibson PCB circuit boards in. The first thing I did was throw it in the bin because, you know, they sound fine if you're someone who just wants to plug a guitar in and play it and not worry about electronics. But if you want to use a different capacitor value or different pots or whatever, you can't do anything with it. You can't even really use the pickup because it has like a sort of clip connector that clip onto the circuit board. It's not a traditional solder, but I'm sure you could strip it and make it work. But yeah, I mean, they're fine until something breaks. But if you want to mess around with your electronics and go from modern wiring to 50s wiring or whatever, you just can't do that with a PCB. So yeah, if you're wanting to experiment, absolutely throw that thing in the bin. Mark kicks ass, like it. Hey Joe, I have a stage right 15 watt tube amp. I want to put a blue or a gold into it. Should I go with the gold for the higher power rating? Um, Both those speakers are kind of ballpark to each other in terms of tone, kind of. They are different, but they sound, they're definitely, you know, fighting the same fight as it were. Of course, the gold has a 50 watt power rating, the blue only has a 15. So the blue would work in a 15 watt amp. And generally speaking, speakers sound more exciting at least, the more you push them to their limits within the range of what they can handle. So in a 15 watt amp, a 15 watt speaker that's getting pushed really hard, will probably you know compress in all the right ways and just work a little bit better and sound a bit more pleasing on the ears than a speaker that's barely ticking over. But I've used the gold in 10 watt amps before and it sounds absolutely fine. So, you know, most people would go with the blue, I think. The blue is the speaker everybody seems to love. And that's why people use two blues and a two by 12 for a 30 watt amp because they don't want to use a gold. Um, but it, I guess the only real question is, do you want to take that speaker out of the 15 watt amp and potentially use it in a higher wattage amp in the future? If so, you might want to future proof yourself a little bit with the 50 watt speaker, which will sound 90, well, maybe slightly less than that, 80% the same as the blue? Or are you happy with a 15 watt speaker in a 15 watt amp and it's gonna stay there and sound great? So it depends how much you want to tinker. Both would work. I would probably go with the blue, to be honest. I think most people probably would given the choice. Frank Haverstad, it seems to me the gain slash tone slash volume was never set at equal levels. Seems like the was it always is set lower. And I included this question because it's relevant for pretty much any comparison video when you're comparing two like-for-like -like things or a modern clone of a vintage thing or whatever. Every pedal, for example, here has components in, all of which are manufactured to a tolerance. So if you ever buy a capacitor for your guitar, you'll see it's 0.22 microfarads plus or minus 20%. So it could be 0.018 or 0.025 approximately. So you never know exactly what the value of the component is until you measure that particular component yourself. And that's true for every component in that pedal, including the parts and 
you know, diodes and all of that. So when doing a comparison video, there isn't much point of just setting the knobs in exactly the same place on each and going, it sounds different, because that could be down to the tolerance rather than the fundamental difference in the pedal, especially if you're comparing a vintage pedal to a modern reproduction, which I did yesterday. Uh, there's a video coming probably on the 5th of April, which is my old um, electric mistress, the 18 volt one, compared to the Past Effects Elastic Mattress, which is a brilliant name. And spoiler alert, it gets really bloody close. Um, but there's no point setting the knobs on the mistress to the same place as the knobs on the mattress and going, well, there's a difference. You can dial in and move around those differences and get them sounding much closer if you find the sweet spots that kind of match each other, which isn't necessarily in the same place. So comparing a standard BD2, which had been modded by Robert Keeley, to a much newer Wasacraft version, if you set the knobs in the same place, you're not necessarily going to get them sounding as close as they could if you just go a tiny bit left, a tiny bit right. So yes, in that video, the Wasa knobs were set slightly differently to the Keeley, but they sounded much closer by doing that. And it's just adjusting for the tolerance more than anything else. So it's not giving a misleading representation. It's not because I'm too lazy to put the knobs in the same place. It's for a purpose. You can dial those tolerances out as much as you can and get them sounding as close as they can. That's the point of a comparison. So, you know, you see that all the time in like, clone clone comparisons and things people saying oh that one's much brighter yeah it's probably because there's a slight difference in tolerance on the treble pot so you know it's important to kind of dial them in as close as you can get them sounding rather than just set knobs in the same place and go they sound different because they probably don't sound as different as you think they do Q Zephyr. To me, it's a shame the Ruby sounds the way it does. I feel like it's missing that bell-like quality I love about most Alnico speakers. I have a gold in a Vox combo, and I'm interested to put a cream in a 4x12 for a higher gain amp. The Ruby is a very different sounding speaker to the blue, gold, and the cream. Those three speakers have a very different power rating, 90 watts, 50 watts, and 15 watts, and they do sound different, but they're all in the same ballpark, as I was kind of saying earlier on about the blue and the gold. The Ruby doesn't really have much high end. And I did make a second video after that four-way comparison of just the Ruby trying to achieve some much better sounds than I did in that video comparing it to the other four. And we can get it sounding really good, but I had to use some pretty extreme EQ on my amps to get it sounding that good. So the Dr. Z Z-Rec was in that video, which is quite a bright sounding AC30 type amp. And I think I had the treble control almost all the way up, which in any other speaker would just take your eardrums out. But with the Ruby, it was just about getting bright. So it's a very different speaker. I think there's another question. Oh yeah, here. This was when I was comparing the Fane A60 to the blue, the gold, and the cream. Jeffrey Kirby. Oh please, Mr. Perkins. There are important similarities between the Ruby and the A60, which is a comparison I didn't shoot. They are both base heavier Alnicos. They have a sil similar relatively flat mid-range response, and I love the Ruby in my Z-Reg, but it could use just a tad more top end. Yeah. I think the A60 might be the ticket. I didn't favour the Alnico cream over the Ruby at all in the Z-Reg, and the gold has the most annoying fizzle fry top end that can't be dialed out. I would love to hear your Z-Reg with the Ruby, and then the A60 both dialed in to their best. I hope you will reconsider and love the channel. I mean, I can shoot a comparison between the Celestian Ruby and the Fane A60. If that's a video you would like to see, please do comment underneath and tell me. It's hard to gauge how much interest there might be for that. I would say they're so different it wouldn't tell as much. But if you guys want to see it, I will definitely shoot that. So let me know in the comments if the interest is there. Um, yeah, the Ruby, I was, it just doesn't really have much top end, is the truth of it. And you know, you say it doesn't have an overly hyped mid-range or whatever it was. The Ruby is all mid-range. To me, it's that kind of honky Brian May type thing, which if you're after that in your Dr. ZZ rec, which is the AC30 type thing, wonderful. But as a versatile speaker, I wouldn't say it's particularly much of an all-rounder. The Fane A60 absolutely is. But let me know if the interest for that video is there, and I will shoot it if enough of you tell me to do it. Joe Stalp again. Are the nostalgics staying in your pool? And this is the nostalgic hybrid pots. So they're CTS pots, but with central, vintage Central Lab innards put in them. So they're kind of Central Lab pots, but you can buy them today. Um, 
I'm not sure is the honest truth on that, Joe. I think I love how they sound. And as I said in the video, we are talking a tiny percentage difference, but that's what tone chasing is all about. I do prefer the sound of my Les Paul with the nostalgic pots in. Um, the one thing I'm struggling with is the linear taper. And you can get used to any taper. They're much the same once you're used to them, really. You know, you're just used to turning the knob slightly differently. But all of my other guitars have log taper pots in. So I'm always kind of moving the linear ones and not quite getting to where I want to be and having to find the sweet spot. Whereas on my other guitars, I can just go boop and it's there. So I'm struggling with the taper a bit, but I love how they sound. So undecided. It'd be great to get my hands on some of those nostalgic pots, but with a log taper. We'll see if that's gonna happen in the future. Eric Dodd, I have a 92 Les Paul standard and I only changed the tuning keys. Now I feel completely inadequate. Don't feel inadequate, Eric, I have a problem. Um, and I think this is an, a, an important point about modding guitars. If you have a guitar and you love how it sounds, don't touch a thing. Please don't mod it for the sake of modding it because other people mod it. If you have your 92 Les Paul standard, which is just a brilliant era of wood for Les Pauls, and you love how it sounds, leave it alone. Don't start making changes because I'm doing it on YouTube. Just leave it. So don't feel inadequate at all. If you've got your guitar and you love it and it sounds like you want it to, just leave the thing alone and enjoy playing it, please. Jerry Macklow. I was surprised by how much difference I could hear. You talked to volume difference. The nostalgics didn't sound so much louder as bigger. They were a little darker, but also clearer. As you said, it was subtle and not noticeable in some of the clips, but definitely noticeable in most, especially when clean. Another entertaining video. I'm off to look through my vintage pot collection. Quite a few people said they had pot collections and they're gonna go digging through for old Central Lab. So I hope you find them. Um, I think bigger is a good way of describing the difference between the VI pots and the nostalgic hybrid pots. And again, they're tiny differences. There was a lot of discussion in the comments about whether it's all hype and people who claim they can hear differences in pot constructions, not just values, are hearing things. And people saying nostalgia is very overrated and all that sort of stuff. It, it's, a, it's a debate that sparks a lot of passion on both sides. I, I would say sounding bigger. I, I, so I would personally say sounding louder as well, to be honest. In the clean bit of playing in that video with the Dr. ZZ reg, it was set loud, but it was still clean with the VI pots. But with the um, nostalgic pots in, the amp was definitely getting pushed into breakup in quite a few places. So I think there was more level coming through, even though on the bridge pickup especially, the values of the VI pots and the nostalgic pots was pretty much exactly the same, give or take like 5k or something. So yeah, I mean, the jury's out on that, but um, a lot of people in the comments were hearing the same things as me. Other people were saying, there's no difference, you're all mad. So I guess the real answer falls in the middle somewhere. Craig Higgins. Hi Joe, did you write the Mentor Pilot theme tune? That is such an amazing track. It deserves a lot more recognition and publicity. Now, if you're here for the guitar demos and the pedals, this will mean absolutely nothing to you. Um, but there is a channel called Mentor Pilot and I did do a theme tune for Petter. I followed that channel pretty much since the beginning. Big fan of aviation, you wouldn't necessarily know it. And he was using originally a piece of stock YouTube royalty-free library music for his theme tune. And I wrote to him saying, would you like me to write you your own theme tune? And he very rightly came back and said, well, to be honest, a theme tune is a theme tune for a reason. People recognize it. I don't particularly want to change it because people associate that tune with me now. So I said, well, okay, it's a piece of kind of stock music. Would you like me to record you your own version of it? So he said, yeah, give it a go. So I did. That's the video that's up on YouTube. And he did use it as the outro for his videos for about 18 months or two years or so. He's gone super pro now. He employs graphic designers to make it all really fancy. So he stopped using it for something that sounds a lot more kind of like commercial. And that's fine. Um, but so I didn't write the song, but I did record a version of it that he did use. So yeah, uh, there is a video of me recording it in real time on YouTube, which is, is what you've seen. So um, no, I didn't write it, but he did use my music for quite a while on his very big channel. Now he's gone over a million subscribers. And finally here, no, I've got a few more, three more, there we go. Sahan Olgan, thank you so much for this comparison, Joe. I found your video coincidentally was all, almost ordering those T. Armands, but your video saved me so much money because I gave up. Sound is, is a subjective thing. 
but I loved the edgy and biting sound of the telly. I already had TV Jones star with telly pickups and I was very happy with it. I was just wondering, may be a set of T almonds would be better, but I got the answer with this video. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate your effort. Thank you, Sahan. And to be honest, I love comments like that saying, I watched your video and you actually saved me money, rather than comments saying, I watched your video and I've just spent some money. I love hearing that they've had a benefit on people's finances rather than just kind of stoking the pedal market as it were. So I love getting comments like that. Thank you for leaving it. John Mirabile, I think. It looks very 59 as it is. I think 92 to 97 issues considered the good wood years. This is what I've mentioned earlier about my Les Paul. For whatever reason, the early 90s Les Paul standards are kind of held in really high regard. And I can see why, because that Les Paul standard of mine, I've had a few different pickups and electronic configurations in it. It sounds brilliant with all of it. It sounds great unplugged. It's just a great sounding lump of wood. Other guitars take a lot of finding the right pickup to match the guitar. That guitar just takes whatever you give it and makes it sound great. So yeah, I mean, they are known as the good wood years, which is quite comical to say, but it does seem to be true. They, it is just an amazing guitar. It's probably one of my best sounding guitars I own, or at least my favorite sounding. And finally this month, probably one of my favorite comments I've had left on this channel in recent years. Steve Turner, this is the only channel where I am normal. In real life, I'm a nerd about these things, but on here, it's okay. It is okay, Steve, and thank you for being here. You're all very welcome to nerd out on here and treat this as a sort of sanctuary and safe place away from other people. So nerds are very welcome on this channel, obviously, because I am definitely one myself. So that is the last question. So thank you ever so much for watching, folks. I'm gonna go and see if I can edit this video and get it uploaded before midnight, which is gonna be quite a task with my internet upload speed. So yeah, some interesting things going to be coming in April. As I said, on the 5th, I've got the Elastic Mattress and the Electric Mistress comparison. Check that one out because they do get really, really close. They are almost indistinguishable apart from the crazy noise floor on my original Mistress. So that's that's gonna be a good one. And I am gonna revisit the Nathan Shepard guitar too. I think uh, the changes I've made. I should probably bring you up to speed on those because you'll be seeing that guitar on the channel a lot more in the future. So thank you ever so much for watching folks. Please do carry on subscribing. I always say it but it does make a huge difference. Apparently I meant to say click the like button as well. What that does I've no idea but click the like button. Why not? And I will see you very very soon. Bye bye!